everyone, welcome back. We are here today talking all about money. And I'm here with Karen Shalou, who has spent her entire career in the legal field as a paralegal and is a passionate advocate for women. She navigated her way through her own divorce and knows firsthand how important it is to assemble the right team for you. But that's not it. I have another guest joining me as well. And let me introduce you to Katherine Shanahan, who is a certified divorce financial analyst and trained mediator after 25 years in the financial industry and her own life experience with divorce. She and co-founder Karen created My Divorce Solution to create a space for women experiencing divorce to be heard and have their financial portraits explained to them in order to start moving forward with a plan. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, thanks so much for being here. And this is such an important topic because I think aside from custody, the money um, and how people are going to live and how they're going to survive post-divorce is the thing that really trips people up the most. And I think it's the thing that prevents people from leaving an unhealthy marriage. I think it's what keeps people stuck. Um, So we're going to talk all about the money and how money alone is not the reason to stay in a marriage that is no longer serving you or in alignment and how you can do that to move forward with confidence. So um, let's I guess let's just start with um, what is a certified divorce financial analyst? Let's just get the terminology out of the way. (laughs) It's a fancy lettering for a financial representative to have a niche market in the divorce field. So our training and our education and the testing just gives you more of a deep dive into what's required in the divorce world and what you should be looking at as a whole rather than just financial planning kind of looking post-divorce. This is just a specialty in the divorce field. Yeah, and it's it's so helpful, I think, for a particular client portrait as someone who maybe isn't quite as well versed in the money talk in their marriage. Maybe they weren't the ones who handled the finances or paid the bills, and they're coming to the table a little bit clueless and a little bit scared. I think that having a professional like you in the divorce process for that additional amount of support um, is key to really allowing them to make decisions and move forward with confidence. Um, because you do something very different than what a lawyer does. And I think a lot of times people depend on their lawyer to provide the type of service that you're providing. So why is it so important that someone have a professional who is really well versed in the money talk and finances in order to help them through this? Yeah, well, we developed the financial portrait because you know a lot of what you just said in the beginning is the anxiety that the person who was not in control of the finances is the access to that information. You know, they right away start and they want to go to their attorney to say, get me all the information because my spouse is hiding it from me. You know, we do work with men and women. So um, some, sometimes both parties want to be um, forthcoming. But the party who wants to start this fight a lot of times because they don't feel like they have access to the documentation. Yeah. Right. That's so true. And I think a lot of people don't realize until after it has already happened that when they go to the attorney, the attorney takes all the information, gets a general assessment of what you as a client know about the situation, which may or may not be relative to the marital estate, because I think as a client, many approach the table with a lot of emotion. They they approach it from a, oh, she or he did this or that, and therefore I'm entitled to this or that. And then the first or second or third question out of the attorney's mouth or the mediator's mouth is, well, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And how many people are nowhere near equipped enough to know what they want at that juncture? But that is where the conversation starts. And that's why we, we created the portrait so that when people are approaching the divorce table with their professional, they can say, well, this is what I have and this is what I want, and this is why I want it. Karen, you raise such an important point because when you ask someone that question, what do you want, their answer is, I want it all. Like, I want all of the money, I want the house, I want all of the retirement, I want everything, and that's not a reasonable expectation. Mm -hmm. And when the professionals 
put it on the client without the client actually knowing what's ha what happens in courts, what the law says, what is reasonable. It's setting them up for this, this expectation that when it's not met, then all of a sudden they're angry and the professionals mm -hmm. didn't do their job or the judge didn't do, you know, didn't listen to them. And um, I think that that's really unfortunate. And I think it keeps people stuck in the litigation for longer and also makes things really um, more expensive than it has to be. Right? Well, think about that. If you have access to the documentation, if your attorney is able to get you that, a lot of times they don't talk about all the components of that information. So without understanding the components, not without being able to interpret what each financial asset or debt actually means to you now and in the future, how do you make those decisions on what you want? You really can't. Right, you can't. And, and know what it means to you. So whether or not you end up with what you want, at least you know what you have, how the courts look at it, and you say a lot of clients want and they want it all. That's true. So many people do. But conversely, there's that many who say, I don't want to get that my spouse upset. Mm. I don't know if I'm entitled to that. All of these emotions play into it from, you know, the unknown. So to Catherine's point, if they, they know what they have, they know what the components of the marital estate is, what's separate, what's joint then they can start to talk about the interpretation of that and what their options are. And then they can make the decision of, I'm going to give it up or I'm going to, to really take what I'm entitled to. Catherine always coaches people <laughs> really well to say, you know, if you, if you feeling guilty about taking what you're entitled to, you can give it back later. Which has never <laughs> happened. <laughs> I'm sure nobody ever gives it back. <laughs> I even say I'll help you write the check to give it back to them. <laughs> Not one person has asked me to help them write a check to give back too much money of what they got. <laughs> That's so true. That's and so funny. you know, funny. another very important factor to all of this is even when you know what you have and you know, you know you're getting to know what it all means and what's part of the marital estate and what there is to divide. You know, getting that agreement in a really good space and knowing what questions to ask and making sure that you understand the details is very important as well. And so a part of our portrait does address that. And Catherine, I think you can speak to that in a better way than I can. Well, imagine, Renee, I'm sure you've heard of people who um, said, okay, I'll take, you can have that Merrill Lynch account. But meanwhile, and I'll take, you know, this bank cash account or what have you. Mm -hmm. But what they didn't realize is in that Merrill Lynch account was a prudential annuity for another annuity, but it's encompassed yeah. in a total value. They don't understand all the components of that one Merrill Lynch account, right? So what they may have negotiated away is a really good annuity that has a lifetime income benefit to it or a guaranteed death benefit rider to it that you just, were, you just let it go because you didn't understand or nobody interpreted or explained to you what you what you were actually giving away there. And then you wake up and you say, oh my gosh, I didn't know that that was there. I think I had one of those and I let my spouse keep it. You know, the, the, that happens so many times or, you know, you keep that, you know, you keep a cash account when you could have kept a tax deferred account that would have compounded more for you for your own retirement saving on the tax dollars, but you just didn't know at that time. Yeah. So it's really important to ask really good questions. I, I think you raise a fundamental point is that even though you have a lawyer, you can't always rely on them to be reading the documentation correctly. And I think that a lot of times in, in a lot of states, there's financial statements. We call them financial affidavits in Connecticut. And someone prepares them. Sometimes it's the lawyer, sometimes it's the paralegal. And if you, if you have an account like you're talking about, Catherine, and it goes on to the financial statement or affidavit and no one's looking deeper into it, it's just being taken at face value. So it's, it's on the client to really 
really understand the finances if they don't have someone like you in the case um, really scrutinizing everything because it happens all of the time. Um, lawyers do miss things, they do misinterpret things. Um, and I think it's so important that the client takes some control and ownership and education um, with this because otherwise, you know, they're relying on someone else to tell them. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they're misinformed. That's a really great point. And that's another reason I love our financial portrait because we come from a knowledge standpoint, not so much an advice giving standpoint. And so when we lay out everything with their recommendations, considerations, verified and non-verified documentation, and we turn it in the emotional piece into an actual factual data piece, yeah, it yeah. gives them that space to start feeling comfortable and start, stop feeling so embarrassed that you were not aware of this information because it's okay. And I'm here to tell you that probably half of my friends are not even aware of their financial um, situation because we just don't care about those things typically yeah, yeah. until yeah, a major yeah. life event happens like divorce. So yeah, it, it, yeah, it is, yeah. don't be, don't be shameful about it. Be powered, empowered by it to get the information. And Karen will talk to this. I mean, we see it all the time, even when she does budgeting with our clients, you actually see their face transform yeah, yeah. into a lighter version of the sadness that they're going into, they're going through. You know, because they're feeling like, oh, okay, I've got this and I'm okay to ask these questions because yeah, it's yeah. my right to know this information. Right. I, so let's talk about budgeting um, because I did want to dive, go into that. And now that you brought it up, it's the perfect time. How important is projecting your future income and debts and bills um, to the process of deciding how everything gets divided? Well, it's super important and maybe one of the most important things you, a person can do in the divorce process right out of the gate because a, a lot of people don't even understand how their lifestyle plays out. So I like to start there. Let's talk about how you have historically spent money. Mm. So is it, do you think about it, how much I spend on my credit cards every month or do you have it, you know, down to a science? But help helping clients understand how they spend money and articulating that for them is so important. And then taking that information and projecting it forward. So moving forward, this is what you have and this is what you're gonna need. So are you going to need to get a job? Are you going to live off your assets? Are you going to spend less? Are you gonna change your lifestyle? How are you going to establish retirement? Are you getting enough retirement in the division of the divorce? Or are you going to have to think about that? So doing that right out of the gate and establishing a really clear understanding of how you've been accustomed to um, spending your money and then how you're going to, what generally you're going to be looking at is so important because it directly plays into the division of asset and what's going to be most advantageous for you because things can be mixed up and, and balanced out and reconciled when you work with your financial um, expert. You know, how much am I going to need for retirement? How much am I going to need for cash flow? What about the taxes and all of those things? And it directly relates to how you spend your money. Do you find that people are surprised when you start looking at how much they're actually spending and when they have to start to break it down? Pretty much 100% of the time. Yeah. Even, well, truth be even, told, some people don't want to get divorced after they do their budget. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And people, yeah. even people who, I I've, have always been historically very budget-minded. I've always known down to the penny where my money's going. Mm. But it doesn't mean that I was smart about it, right? Yeah. So it doesn't mean that I included self-care. It doesn't mean I included retirement. It doesn't mean I included a lot of things. I just general, not generally, I know how my money is spent. Yeah. So helping people understand all the different factors of a holistic and healthy lifestyle moving forward and even factoring in, how am I gonna pay my attorney's fees? How am I gonna pay for these other experts? I know I need a divorce coach. How am I gonna pay for that? And getting that established so that you that, that piece of the stress can be alleviated or yeah. minimized at the very least so that you can move ahead. Because living in fear of that next attorney's bill yeah. or, or I really need a therapist, but I don't know if I can afford it. We work through that. Let's, let's, let's set you up. So maybe you're gonna have to give up some things 
until you get through divorce, but then you're going to reestablish them right away when you're done. Really helps through that process. Yeah, and most lawyers are not having that type of conversation with their clients. They're not asking them, did you budget enough for self-care? It's just not part of that conversation. You're not trained in law school to talk to clients that way. It's just not really, it's like not our job description. Now, like where I practice, we absolutely encompass all of that because we take a little bit of a different approach. But generally speaking, I think that most lawyers are not having that conversation. And I think it is so important to fit all of that in so that you at the end of this, like when you come out of the divorce, you are paying your bills, you're not house poor, you can go on vacation and start enjoying life again. And you're not going to enjoy life if if you're you're struggling. That's so true. true. And And if you realize that you you can't go on vacations or you can't do those things because you don't know how to budget, guess what? You might have to get a job. You know, nobody likes to hear that. And so it's a tough conversation and it's a big Mm -hmm. reality check. And some people have their, I must have things and I, some things I can do without. And that's the other nice um, additive to doing a budget. Um, You know, we just had a case and you know there's just a big financial disconnect and a lot of marriages break up because of financial issues you know there's a financial infidelity it's an actual thing and there's just secrets being kept from each other with their spending habits and you know client was so nervous to have that conversation and karen had it with both the husband and the wife but i think sometimes people walk away feeling relief and we've actually had people get their portrait done and not get divorced just because they decide they'll work on the emotional stuff now that they've covered the financial stuff Mm. you know you can't work on one without the other yeah yeah or Uh you can't work on them both together you know you don't stay because of financial reasons if you're compromising your health and happiness right but how do you work on your health and happiness if you have no idea what your financial life will look like Mm. so we say get your financial life in order and then decide if you want to work on the emotional. Maybe it was just a financial problem. Yeah. Or maybe okay. it's, yeah, this is our life and this is this verifies or clarifies why we need to move on. All right. Either so way, yeah. One of the, the really difficult topics that comes up over and over again is that people are emotionally attached to a house. Mm-hmm. And they want to stay put in their house no matter what, no matter that it's not financially feasible. Um, They're they're saying, um, I'm going to make this work and I want the house and they're kind of clawing onto it. What's your take on that? And and how do you start thinking about whether you sell the house or keep it? Well, after doing your budget, I always put them through an emotional exercise. And I just say, as we're working on your financial data, go out and see where else you would live. Just drive around, get a realtor if it's a friend and go into some Mm -hmm. rentals, go into some homes. Because the problem with the home is that divorce is so much change, right? And usually the person who takes care of the house is usually the one gathering all the documents that they can for the budgeting or for initiating the divorce. They're usually the ones that are doing a lot of work, going through the home, packing up things. That's a lot. So to ask somebody to change so many things in their life, the home is the only thing that they're holding on to. So if they didn't want the divorce, they feel like they're holding on to a piece of their marriage. And if they did want the divorce, they just say, I'll do this later without thinking about what they're actually left with when the divorce is settled. I I have very few women in particular who have said that they were happy that they kept the house. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's feasible, but when you lay it out in front of them and say, well, this is your budget. And if you spend sometimes upwards of half or two thirds of your budget on that mortgage payment and and maintaining a house. How many people are able to maintain a house of the size that they're accustomed to living in? Um, You know, then you're giving up vacations or travel or things you want to do or retirement or a whole host of other things. So when it's laid out in front of them, then they can make better decisions for themselves Um, And, you know, sometimes keeping the house is is great. Sometimes it's really not the best decision, but allowing yourself space to consider and know what the consequences are and then to be making that decision, not from an emotional space, but from a financial space um, is very empowering. 
do you look at the house as uh, looking at all of their income, like how much of their income should be put towards housing? Yes, we do. And that's part of the budget work we do with them. Um, the budget work for us goes through the entirety of developing the portrait because things change. Sometimes someone gets an apartment or sometimes they get temporary um, housing or whatever. So we're constantly working with that. And, and the real estate market has been crazy lately. So that's yes. another whole yeah. layer of complexity and negotiation. You know, just trying to decide, well, if I buy something else, what does this mean? All of that. But it's definitely a part of the budget work we do with them and also um, the financial portrait piece where they're considering um, with their financial advisors where they want to end up. And I, I always have these conversations in their reviews about the house. You know, that's one of the topics I really mm -hmm. um, hone in on because I actually moved out of a very large house into a very small condo and I rented for a few years. Um, and I found it to be very therapeutic in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. my kids were not messed up because yeah. I moved yeah. them from the home, right? But I also hear from a lot of women who decide to keep the home because they're holding on to something one way or another, whether it's for ease or for whatever their reasons are. And then their spouse goes and buys a new house or their spouse gets to own you know, a shiny new car or shiny new house with shiny new furniture for their kids to now go decorate. And now they're feeling again, another loss, yeah, right? Yeah. So you have to really remember if you're thinking emotionally, you have to think of the flip side, which we don't like to think about. What, how will I feel emotionally if all of that stuff occurs? And if, that, if that's why I'm staying, because you could be making a huge financial mistake based on a big emotional misconception. Um, and it's really a good exercise to go through um, for yeah. yourself yeah. in the long run. And, and thank you for sharing that. that. That, yeah. that personal story, because I did the same thing. I, I, my husband and I had bought up, uh, built our house. So we had this big, shiny new house. And then I was the one who ended up walking away from it. I didn't want it because I knew that the lawn was too much. The snow plowing was too much. And I did the same thing. I was in a condo for uh, probably about a year and a half until I went and found something. And it's just, it's like, it's the energy attached to that house, you know? And it was like, I didn't want to walk around and feel that energy from room to room. I wanted like a fresh something to feel a new energy. And I felt like staying there would keep me stuck. And also practically, it just like, I didn't want to have to deal with it. So I think that you bring up a really good point. Yeah. So true. It's so hard to do. So, you yeah, know, yeah. Renee, you and I sit here and we say this, right? And we share mm -hmm. our stories because I'm 10 years, almost 11 years out of it. <laughs> but yeah, I remember yeah. crying every night like, oh, oh my yeah. gosh, my kids are in this tiny little thing. My son's a mm -hmm. football player. He's huge. He takes up the whole family room now. You know? <laughs> and I remember thinking it was first. And, and, you know, my daughter texted me even last night. She showed me what she made chicken cutlets and asparagus, which is something I make all the time. And she's like, oh, my gosh, my apartment smells like mom. And that's what I say to the women out there. You know, yeah. don't feel like you're inferior if your spouse has a bigger home because the yeah. kids walk in and it smells like home. Yeah. And yeah. that's what makes it a home. It's what you bring inside the doors, not what's really, on, you know, outside or what it perceived to be. I, I love that. Story. And just to add in my own experience to that is because I w moved into something totally affordable for me at that time, I was able to go have experiences. So my son and I went to a dude ranch and we went to, you know, we did all of these really, really fun things and fun vacations. And that's what he talks about. It's those memories of that time. It has nothing to do where he laid his head at night. And, you know, it's, I think that it's just a different way to think of it. So anyone's out there trying to weigh whether you keep the house or not, I'm just, you know, think of it in a different way and think about the opportunities if you let go of something, like what can actually come yeah, in. Yeah, that's so true. I had the same experience with my kids. And to your point, it has nothing to do with where they lay their head at night, yeah. only to the extent that they knew where they were going to lay their head that night. Yes. If you can give them that support and that comfort and that confidence of knowing and mm -hmm. being able to count on it, that's, that's what they need. Right. All right, so let's talk about someone who has um, historically been a stay-at-home mom 
and now they're faced with the prospect of having to go out and find work. Maybe they need to, maybe they don't need to. I'm curious about what your take is and what your advice is um, as to finding employment post-divorce. Are you gonna take that, Catherine? So, um, you know, for those that don't have to work, we all need to be accountable to something. Yeah. Something, someone, some daily thing, because you can, Roll, roll up in a ball and cry for only so many days and then you have to be accountable and a lot of those stay-at-home moms their kids now are you know, they're also empty nesters so you're really going through a lot of transition which is really hard so my first suggestion is to go out and find out what you're interested in when it comes to volunteering somebody always needs somebody else and you probably have a lot of internal resources that you can provide share with a lot of other people so either volunteering or showing up at not for profits or anyone that needs some help. Um, you wanna take the job part, Karen, or you want me to keep going? Yeah, so when we're working with clients, uh, we can kind of help them understand what skill sets they have. Sometimes they feel very, um, maybe inferior is a good word because they haven't worked for so long I'm not good enough um, but you know sometimes you can go online and do these tests these career tests that are fabulous your local community colleges have a lot of career guidance that you can just hop in and start exploring without committing mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways that you can find some interest in what you're good at and um, just start there um, and you know, some some women think that oh, I want to start my own business, or I want to try this, or I want to try that, and just giving yourself some space, not not thinking oh, I have to go out and I have to get this job and I have to make this much money, but really starting to explore and reinvent the new you, moving forward, and and you know even be even. Um, considering how am I going to be there for my family. I know I had to consider that a lot because my kids were really small and I was committed to being home for them when they got off that school bus. So I was able to arrange a schedule with my employer that I could come in earlier and leave later. And so I think a lot of people may not realize that there's a lot of bandwidth um, for you to, to start your new journey uh, moving ahead. And you know, if you pick a job today, I always wanted to be a cashier at a food store. I just wanted to use the scanner all the time. I, I didn't do that, but you know, you could pick something that just would be fun for you. Yeah, that's yeah. giving your own sense of independence, yes. of getting your own paycheck, and it doesn't have to be your forever job. You know, yeah. now we live in this virtual world, so there's a lot more opportunities for you to work for companies nationally, right? Yeah. So just go out and try something that gives you some interest, and keep your mind open. You know, with an open mind, like we, you said before. A lot of things happen. A lot of positive things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think that there's so much independence, and in when you get start having your own income coming in, and there is there that emotional like, hey, I can do anything. Like I can rise above anything. I don't need to be supported. And I think that there's just so much power in that. Um, and I think that even if you didn't need it, it's a really good reason to like look and find something that kind of fills you up or brings you joy, um, just to help you move past the divorce. Absolutely. And you know, everyone is establishing, you know, their role as the yeah. new CEO of their life, yeah. right? So that's, that's fun. And when I say that to people in the beginning, that doesn't sound fun. It doesn't yeah. sound like anything <laughs> I want to even attempt. It sounds overwhelming but as we continue to work it it becomes something that they're proud of i got this and i'm doing it and i'm doing it well who knew yeah um, so it's fun and it's exciting all right so let's pivot now because we're getting to the end of our conversation and let's talk about the mrs to me summit that is coming up soon um there's still time to get tickets um it is an incredible event i am totally biased because i will be there but can you share a little bit about the event yes this event is really near and dear to my heart because i remember um when i went through my divorce i felt like some of my married friends who really sided on my ex's side thought I had like the plague or something, like it would be contagious. And I felt like when I would go out to a bar just to have dinner, people looked at me like I was there to pick somebody up. 
there was really no place to go where you felt understood yeah. or that you could go that you didn't have to bitch about your ex or bitch about yeah, what it is yeah. because, you know, we were moving on now. So Karen and I decided to start the Mrs. To Me Summit, bring in inspirational speakers like yourself, which we're very excited about Ooh. to have you there, um, and bring women together where they don't feel judged and they yeah. feel yeah. like they can cry if they want to because they're just yes. hearing something that hits them to their, your, to their core or they cheer somebody else on. And you really will get that feeling when you're there. Not only is it in a beautiful place, yeah. Yeah. but with just being around people who understand and this year is a little interesting because we, I know of some widowers that are coming and wow. um, some married women who are coming because although it's for women going through divorce, thinking divorce or have gone through it, I think it's really inspiring for all yeah, of us, yeah. you know, especially now yeah. during this time. I attended an event a few weeks ago. It was a live event, and I can tell you the energy from being in a live setting and around people and watching the speakers and I mean it, it's something so motivating like I'm still flying high from it and I think that people who attend this summit are going to experience the same thing it's like you're going to feel totally unstoppable when you come out the other side because you're so supported you've you've listened to speakers you've engaged with other people who have gone through this and have made these connections and there's something that like you can't just you can't do that over zoom you know virtual yeah. events just don't they're just missing that piece of it yeah and we've done that for the past 15 18 months you know we've all yeah. put on you know put right. on our boots and hopped on zoom and it it worked and it was a good band-aid and it still works in a lot of different mm -hmm. environments but it doesn't take the place of human physical connection where you know you can draw off the energy in the room which is just amazing we yes. will be very safe and conscious so that we are keeping all attendees safe so that you know everyone can just focus on you know meeting new people and looking forward to all of the exposure to so many opportunities ahead for everybody yeah so that's just going to be so exciting and there's nothing like the ocean air i mean the semester yeah, is know. right on the ocean and there's nothing like a nice cocktail that actually cheers to you at night <laughs> versus yeah. the ones on zoom but um you know listening to what you're going to say i think will be really um beneficial to everybody there and it's true just being around that it we, we feed yeah, off yeah. each other right absolutely so i hope to see a, um a ton of women that i get to meet new women that i have never met and yeah. of course the old ones coming back which is really exciting to yeah. see how they've transformed through their divorce and you've you've capped the number of tickets so there's not going to be a thousand people there for COVID purposes you're keeping this small and intimate so how many tickets are available i think there's probably we... about 50 more available mm -hmm. all right yeah, yeah and i don't know how many vip tickets are left and i don't know how many you know each speaker got a discount code i don't know if your discount is up or not i know that i'm trying to beat everybody so mine might be up <laughs> <laughs> So if you're listening so and you go to our website and you know one of the speakers, or if you didn't know one of the speakers, you can email us, you can email anybody and say, hey, do you have a discount code that you can offer to me? Because, you know, if, if one speaker has ran out of their codes, maybe another speaker may have it available for you to have a discount. Yeah. Um, because we really do want to make this um, available for all who want to attend. Absolutely. So if anyone's listening, um, that you can reach out to me directly and I'll share my discount code. But can you just share what the the pricing to attend this event is? Because that part it like blows my mind because it is so not expensive and it is accessible to everyone. Yes, yeah, so the general admission tickets are two hundred and fifty dollars and the VIP tickets are four hundred and fifty dollars. And that's like all weekend. Like that's something that it's that's crazy. I paid it's a whole lot more yeah. for the event that I attended a few weeks ago. It includes um, two cocktail hours, breakfast and lunch on Saturday as well, and breakfast on Sunday, I believe, if I may be mistaken there, and a swag bag to die for. Ooh, I uh, heard that. A great <laughs> panel of speakers, several book signings. The list goes on and on. So just 
yeah, it's well, well worth the money. Very reasonable. We have it that way because a lot of people going through divorce are kind of cash depleted at some point or another. So we want yeah. to make this affordable and we're very lucky to have very generous sponsors who um, are hopping in to accommodate um, for th so that we can keep the price of the tickets very reasonable. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what you get from that is going to be worth so much more than the dollar amount of that ticket. And I just ordered for um, everyone who attends a gift that I will give out during my talk. So I'm um, nice. pumped for this. I am like super so excited. Yeah. So, all right, so where can people go to check out more information, look at the itinerary and get more details? Hop on over to www.mydivorcesolution.com, go to the events page, and you'll see the Mrs. To Me event right there. If you have specific questions for us, email us at hello at mydivorcesolution.com. All right, awesome. I hope if anyone is thinking about this, they make the investment in themselves. They are so, you are so, so worth that investment and so worth connecting and making time for yourself. So I really hope that we uh, we see some listeners there. So ladies, thank you so much for being here and sharing all of your wisdom. And I am going to see you in person very soon. Can't wait, so excited. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. <laughs>